Hello and welcome to the Of Interest podcast. I'm Gareth Vaughan from interest.co.nz. As the October 14 election approaches, the competition for our votes is heating up. Political parties have their election hoardings and signs up, they're spamming us on social media, and they're travelling the country, pressing the flesh, and no doubt at least one of them is going to kiss a baby at some point. Keeping a political party and election campaign running, like many things in life, requires money. Who and where does this money come from, and what do those who provide it expect in return? To discuss this and more, I'm joined by Max Rashbrook. Max is a senior research fellow in the School of Government at Victoria University and has undertaken major research in the area of political donations. Hi, Max, and welcome to the Of Interest podcast. Hi, Gareth. Pleasure to be joining you. Very timely, obviously, with the election approaching to be speaking with you about political donations because you've done a lot of work in this area, including the report Money for Something, report on political party funding in New Zealand that you did uh, with your colleague from Victoria University, Lisa Marriott, just, just late in 2022. So I thought maybe we could just kick off by looking at what exactly is a political donation? How do we define it in New Zealand? Well, I think a lot of people would have a reasonably good intuitive sense of what a donation is. You know, it's a, an amount of money that's given to a political party, and that can be a small amount, you know, someone giving the Green Party $50 a month, or it can be, you know, someone giving the National Party $250,000 in one go. Um, in a more technical sense, donations aren't particularly well defined in law, but, you know, internationally, obviously, the, the core recognise that the core of the concept is it's a sum of money given at least ostensibly for nothing in return. You know, so it's different to buying merchandise off a political party where you get something for the money you give them and they don't have, they don't have to declare that. Uh, whereas a donation, it's, it's all about the gift. It's something given, nothing coming back in return, at least in theory. So how dependent are our political parties on financial donations? Well, it's hard to be absolutely precise because up until Labour recently changed the law, political parties haven't had to publish their accounts. Uh, they will now. We'll see the first set of accounts next year. Um, but just you know, anecdotally, through the research that Lisa Merritt and I did, it's pretty clear that donations are very important to political parties. Um, you look at the amounts they bring in sort of in the millions of dollars a year, and that's about what it costs to keep a large political party running. It's roughly what it costs to contest an election. And the fact that political parties spend such a huge amount of time going out and getting donations tells you that they're really important to them financially. And that's in part because the, the old sort of post-war model of having mass membership and therefore getting a lot of revenue from your members has, of course, gone largely gone the way of the dodo. You know, memberships are very small, and so political parties are much more reliant than they were 50 years ago, say, on these big, particularly the big donations um, from individuals. And how and what do political parties have to report when it comes to donations? So they face a sort of varying um, requirements. Again, up until very recently, they only had to disclose the names of donors if people gave over $15,000. And donations over $30,000 in particular had to be disclosed within 10 days uh, of their receipt because of a view that you know these particularly big sums might lead to influence and so it's important that we know about them quickly. Uh, below $15,000 political parties have generally had to report the amounts they receive in bands, so sort of between $1,500 and $5,000, between $5,000 and $15,000, but just as an aggregate. So a party would say, uh, this year we got $425,000 in donations of between $5,000 and $15,000, but they didn't have to disclose the names of those. The law change that Labor made at the end of last year means that now donations that are over $5,000 have to have their names disclosed. So that's a reasonably significant increase um, in transparency. But, yeah, we, don't, we certainly don't know the, the identities of people who are giving less than $5,000. 
And presumably one donor can give lots of donations below the $5,000 mark. So that could add up to a major sum if they wanted to, you know, if they wanted to, I guess, remain anonymous. Uh, no, and I mean, they can't, they certainly can't technically do that, no, because donations are treated as being cumulative. Okay. Um, you know, so if, you know, within a year you gave the Labour Party, you know, three donations of $2,000, that would tip you over the 5000 uh threshold and you'd have to report that donation. You could stay under the threshold by giving the Labour Party $4,999 each year um, because the, the thresholds operate on a yearly basis. The other thing that you can do and that we have seen people do is split up their donations amongst other people or entities that they control to some degree or another. So someone wants to give, um, you know, national $100,000, but they don't want their name disclosed. So they parcel that out amongst their relatives and trusts and shell companies that they control. Each of those gives under the threshold and their identity isn't disclosed, although in point of fact, they have given $100,000. So traditionally there has been that, that loophole around what's called donation splitting. Okay. In terms of who can donate money to a New Zealand political party, who or what, I guess, are there any rules around that? Are there any limits? And what about someone from overseas? Are they able to? Yeah, so there's very few restrictions in that sense. I mean, the, the whole New Zealand system is based on not really restricting donations to any great extent. It's, it's premised on transparency only. You know, it's sufficient that we know what's happening in theory. I mean, I, I, I don't find that convincing, but that's how the New Zealand system runs. Other country, a large number of other OECD countries, um, in contrast, do a number of things like banning donations from anyone except natural persons. You know, so basically you have to be an enrolled voter um, to donate in a number of countries. Uh, that's, that's certainly true in Canada, for instance. Uh, whereas in New Zealand, any kind of entity can donate. And so you have these problems with trusts and companies declaring and it's not always uh, donating and it's not always clear what the, the origin of the money is. On the foreign donations point, that is the one place where in theory New Zealand limits donations. In theory, you can't give more than $50 to a New Zealand political party um, if you're a foreigner. But in practice, and we saw this with a very large $100,000 donation to National some years back, if you are based overseas but you incorporate a company in New Zealand, you can transfer the money to that company or indeed that organisation and then that organisation gives the money and you have just instantly circumvented uh, that, that notional Restriction, and that happened with the that large donation the national got from the I think it was the Inner Mongolian Horse Riding Association, you know, which essentially was 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 money um, coming from Asia. So even that notional restriction doesn't work very well. It's an interesting donor to a New Zealand political campaign. Anyway, um, what do we know about the the types of people and entities that do donate money to our political parties? Um, and, and also, what do we know about what they want or expect? Because as you, you, you set out right from the beginning, a donation sort of implies you don't want anything, but do we really believe that they don't want anything? Um, yeah, it, it does stretch credulity, I think, because you know it's just not generally the case in life that people give vast sums of money without the expectation of anything return, in return, particularly in politics. You know, in that sort of intersection of power and money, uh, you know, is 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 it really likely that this is all completely philanthropic? I mean, it, it doesn't seem very credible on the face of it, and you know, we, and we know from just the massive history of scandals all around the world that very often people giving large sums of money to political parties want something in return, and uh, and that also I think is the case in New Zealand, and so part of the work that Lisa Marriott and I did last year was we actually went and interviewed a whole lot of people in the political system, including, you know, party secretaries and fundraisers and MPs and things. But we also spoke to eight uh, sort of large donors to political parties across the spectrum. 
and, and ask them about their motivations for donating. And, I mean, all of them denied up front that they, up front that they enjoyed any influence as a result. But when you, you dug into that a bit, it became clear that, for instance, well, one of them said, look, it makes it easier to get a meeting with a minister. You know, so very openly saying, we are buying access. And access is obviously the precondition to exercising influence. It's very hard to influence someone if you can't get near them. Um, we also had donors talking about uh, how, you know, when there'd been a Labour donor, uh, Helen Clark had come around and had dinner with them, and now that they were an ACT donor, David Seymour would sort of, quote, pop in for a chat about life, unquote. Um, you know, another one said, well, as someone who's a bit far right as a business owner, you know, I'm not going to support a party that isn't pro-business. Um, so they were very clear at the least that they were donating because they saw that the party was ideologically aligned with them. You know, so they weren't just donating because they believed in democracy, which is always the line that we're told publicly by political party fundraisers. Uh, and it's very clear that in some instances, you know, they were buying access and more than that, I think what we really saw was a glimpse into a, a, a quite a murky world in which party leaders, including prime ministers, fundraisers and these big money donors are constantly in other, each other's company. You know, there's this sort of network of socialization, these big fundraising dinners, these encounters, these dinners uh, at the donors' houses, this enormous access, informal access to party leaders that the rest of us couldn't hope to enjoy. And so there's an immense sort of socialization. And during that process, you know, I think it's fairly obvious that the views and interests of the donors and the politicians are to some extent going to become aligned. So you've, you've talked there a bit about donations, giving people access to senior politicians perhaps some influence over them and an advantage over average New Zealanders who, who, who don't make these donations and you know, probably can't. Um, are there direct examples of where donations have... Do, I mean, do, do we have direct examples where donations have influenced policies? I mean, how easy is it to draw a link between them? It, it's always quite difficult to draw the link because, I mean, naturally all this stuff is, is you know, done in the shadows and, you know, it's very rare that you can find conclusive evidence. Um, but, we, we, I mean, we do have some instances certainly, um, you know, under both national, previous national and Labour governments, large donors have had citizenship applications approved uh, against the advice of officials. Uh, you know, we had Morris Williamson um, I mean, some years ago intervening in a police um, inquiry into a major donor for which he lost his portfolios. Um, and then more recently, uh, you know, Stuart Nash, of course, had to step down after it was found that he had shared confidential cabinet information with people who were his donors. You know, and so those are only sort of the examples that we see. Um, and... You know, I think it would be very surprising if those were the only uh, instances of donations leading to influence. Then your sense would be that they would be the tip of the iceberg? I think so. I mean, that, that's always hard to prove. But I guess sort of one point, um, you know, in favour of that argument is that, you know, the, the big scandals uh, that have occurred recently, in particular the court cases in the last few years involving National Labour and New Zealand First, have not been discovered uh, by the authorities acting on their own initiative. They haven't been found by regular audits or, you know, sort of really um, comprehensive and searching uh, enforcement practices. They have come about through whistleblowers. You know, basically, uh, Jamie Lee Ross sort of, in a very strange way, blowing the whistle on national donations, which also put Labour in the gun eventually, or the whistleblower in the New Zealand First Foundation case. And 
the, the point about that is that if these cases are coming to light only because of whistleblowers, not because the Electoral Commission off its own bat was looking for these sorts of things and found them, uh, it suggests that unless there has been a whistleblower in every single major possible case of donations related to corruption recently, which seems extremely unlikely, uh, one can only conclude that there are more, many more cases out there which just haven't had a whistleblower uh, blow the whistle on them. Obviously, we're in the middle of an election campaign now, so it's always interesting to, I guess, assess whether political donations can influence elections. And obviously, is there an advantage in for the party or parties who are able to raise more money? Um, I mean, can you, can you draw links between parties raising or receiving more money and donations and having a bigger war chest and actual election victories, whether it be, you know, general election like we're having in New Zealand right now or, or a mayoral election or, I guess, even individual candidates within seats? Yes, I, it, it's a complicated question and it's certainly not, um, you know, it's purely the case that more money equals success. Um but, you know, you, to some extent you can take it from the horse's mouth. Um, in a recent RNZ story, David Farrer, who of course is the pollster for, for National and hugely involved in the sort of national uh, machine, said, well, look, you always want more money if you can have it because it gives you more options. You know, so that, that's him being really clear about it. I mean, people would also say, and I think it's true, that money is not the be-all and end-all. Um, someone I spoke to once from the Labour side of things said, look, I would rather have, you know, a great candidate, you know, a great leader uh, with a really good message um, and very little money than a terrible uh, candidate with a terrible message and tons of money. Um, so money isn't the be-all and end-all. But the same person said, if everything else is equal, then you absolutely want to have more money because it costs a lot to run an election. You know, it's not just buying advertising, although that's a lot of it. It's paying for polling. It's paying for strategists. It's paying for people to organise your volunteers. It's travel. It's hall hire. It's building the databases. It's doing all the social media stuff. You know, it's, it's hugely expensive. And so when you look at the international evidence, um, you know, it's, it's a mixed bag. But by and large, I would say the biggest, most recent studies do generally find that the more money you have, the greater your electoral success and that it is correlated. You know, an increase in the budget for a political party will, again, you know, sort of other things being equal, lead to a larger vote share. So, yes, I think ultimately, you know, our common sense intuitions are correct. Money does make a difference in elections. You mentioned social media there, and that's an area that I'm, I, I think is really interesting. I mean, obviously we had that big international scandal a few years ago involving Cambridge Analytica where personal data uh, belonging to millions of Facebook users was collected without their consent by the, the British consulting firm and predominantly used for political advertising, notably um, Donald Trump um, on that one. Um, I'm just curious, to what extent do we see anything like that going on in New Zealand? I mean, uh, you know, social media sort of politicians are certainly very active there. And I mean, you know, one example that I, I've come across in recent months, which is somewhat comical really, is um, my 13-year-old son was constantly being spammed really by Christopher Luxon TikToks and to the extent that he, I mean, he's 13, he can't vote anyway. He got so sick of them that he, he blocked them, you know, so, but that's not doing national any favours because this kid can't vote anyway. Um, so I just wonder like, what, is there anything sort of really untoward on social media that we're aware of at this point? I wouldn't say that there is in New Zealand I mean, one always has to be on guard against those sorts of things. I certainly don't want to sound complacent. But I don't think anyone has established a case that there is, you know, a huge amount of um, dark money flooding into New Zealand, say from overseas, that is being used to manipulate social media at scale. Um, you know, I just haven't seen any evidence of that. I haven't even particularly seen 
anything anecdotally um, that would give me pause for concern. I also think, just as a general point, that some of those fears may have been overstated. You know, I think some the stories about how incredibly powerful Cambridge Analytica was were stories that were seeded by Cambridge Analytica, you know, who had a vested interest in making themselves look amazing until it all, um, you know, blew up in their faces. And then also I think some of the, you know, the studies that have been done have struggled to show, you know, any sort of evidence of that that Cambridge Analytica or anything like that actually swung elections or even, you know, that Russian interference really swung the, you know, the, the 2016 election in the US. I think we have to be on guard against these things, but I think they can be played up too much at the expense of just kind of the standard things that we would be concerned about like lobbying of politicians and donations to politicians in the ways that we already know about. There's been quite a lot of coverage this year about how much more money National and indeed ACT have raised in comparison to Labor. I think the last figures I saw, and you you may be aware of more recent ones, but 2021 to 2023 uh, this was from August. Had National at 8.2 million, Act at 4.2 million, and Labour at 1 million. Is that sort of a normal pattern, or is it a bit different at the moment? No, it's we're in, we're in a really um, unprecedented situation at the moment. Um, I mean, there isn't very good long term data, um, but if you sort of go back to 2011. Um, National has always raised more money uh, than Labor. And that's been particularly true because um, although there's this perception that Labor is still really reliant on trade unions and that somehow balances out, in quotes, business donations to National, in point of fact, trade union donations have all but dried up, um, you know, in line with the sort of declining strength of trade unions generally. So Labor gets sort of, you know, pretty small sums from unions. Whereas, you know, if, since 2011, National has out, out fundraised it by quite a margin. But that's really accelerated um, since the 2020 election. And National and ACT are out fundraising Labour and the Greens by about five to one. You know, I mean, they're raking in millions of dollars every year. Uh, National has got a donation of $500,000 in one go, which is almost unheard of um, in New Zealand. Uh, they're getting lots of donations of $100,000 or $250,000. You know, meanwhile, Labour and the Greens are sort of, uh, you know, their t- total donations, big donations for this year might be about sort of five hundred, seven hundred thousand dollars $700,000 each. So there's an enormous imbalance that has opened up since the last election of a sort that, I, that we certainly haven't seen in, in recent memory. It's certainly interesting. Um do you, I mean, there's obviously lots of factors in that. I mean, you mentioned the $500,000 donation. I th- believe that was from a businessman by the name of Warren Lewis, um, Managing Director of Fairview Metal Industries. So I guess if, if, if one person decides to give $500,000 to National or whoever, whichever party, that can move the dial in New Zealand. Is, is it a case of wealthy individuals that are, that are making most of these donations? Yes, certainly the large ones. I mean, there are also, you know, the donations, as I said before, that are declared an aggregate, you know, of between $1,500 and $5,000, and in the past between $5,000 and $15,000. But, I mean, of course, even those are sums that are certainly out of reach of poorer New Zealanders. And, you know, I mean, anyone even in the squeezed middle at the moment is hardly going to be um, giving a political party $4,000 when they can barely pay the mortgage. So... Yes, I mean this is this is this is very much the large donations. Apart from, as I said, a small number of trade union ones to Labour, this is very much the preserve um, of wealthy individuals. Um, most of them men, as it happens, and most of them people who have made their money um, in business. And some of those are more recently uh, successful business people. Some of the people who sort of go back to the Rogernomics period in the eighties, you know, so the the Gibbs, you know, still give money. Trevor Farmer, Craig Heatley, uh, you know, David Richwhite has just popped up again making donations. You know, so this is very much the elite end of town that's providing the the vast bulk 
of the donations. In the Money for Something report that yourself and, and Lisa Marriott um, published last year, you make the point that democracy relies on equality between citizens when some people have greater influence on key decisions or greater access to people who have influence. Democracy is undermined. I mean, that comment and what you've just been saying about who's donating and how much would tend to suggest that maybe democracy is in danger of being undermined via donations. Yes, I, I, I think the... The good thing in New Zealand is that we do have a lot of other guardrails um, against corruption and against that sort of undermining of democracy. You know, we, you know, we score reasonably highly on well, we score very highly on the Corruption Perceptions Index, the Transparency International runs. Now that's got its problems, uh, but you know, compared to a lot of countries, we've got a reasonable degree of openness. Public information is reasonably easy to find. We have a ministerial code, um, you know, that regulates how ministers behave. We have a pretty neutral and, and independent public service. Uh, so there are, you know, there, there are some guardrails. Um, but I do think, I mean, in, in the report, we likened it to a sort of system of defence, as you imagine, sort of the, the city walls that surrounded the old medieval cities. You know, in sort of New Zealand's, the protections we have of sort of the integrity uh, of decision making, the integrity of politics, you know, th those are quite big and strong ramparts. But because we don't really regulate donations beyond a bit of transparency, it's a bit like having these very impressive uh, sort of city walls and then just having left the back door open, you know, for, for, for certainly potential corruption uh, to, you know, come through almost unimpeded. So, while I still think the New Zealand system works fairly well and in a number of ways, the failure to regulate donations is absolutely, and, and multiple reports over multiple years have pointed this out, it is absolutely one of the most glaring weaknesses in our system and the biggest probably point of vulnerability uh, along with lobbying um, when it comes to the integrity of the New Zealand political system. In, in the Money for Something report, you have five key recommendations from that. I'll just quickly run through those. So recommendation one, the identity of all donors giving over $1,500 must be disclosed. Number two, no individual may give a party more than $15,000 in a 12-month period. Number three, only eligible voters can donate. Number four, the Electoral Commission should be given greater powers to detect donations fraud. And number five, state funding should be introduced in the form of tax credits and democracy vouchers plus lump sum payments to smaller parties. I'm just really interested in those. And obviously there's an um, independent ele electoral review running at the moment that was launched by the then Justice Minister Chris Farfoy last year, which has its final report due in November. I mean, of, of your five recommendations, perhaps the, the state funding one is the most interesting because that, that would be quite a departure for New Zealand, wouldn't it? Um, it would to an extent, although we do have state funding of political parties. Um, obviously, there's the broadcasting allowance, which hands out the political party several million dollars every election, you know, for them to use on, on election ads. And we also provide a lot of money, I mean, a much, much larger sum of money to the political parties to run their parliamentary wings, you know. So there's a lot of funding... Uh, that goes, and this is in the tens of millions of dollars, that goes to the leader's office for each political party for them to do their research and their comms and policy development and, and, all, and all sorts of things. So actually we already have um, funding for political parties to some extent. The, the question is just would we benefit from a small increase in that? And the, the thread that I think holds together all our recommendations is that we as New Zealanders would all be better off if we shifted from a system that relies on large amounts of money from a small number of donors to a system that relies on small amounts of money from a large number of donors. So that you're preserving people's freedom to donate to a political party of their choice, but what you're doing is you're creating a world where political parties aren't beholden to any one donor because no one is giving them a very large amount of money and actually they're incentivized to go out and connect 
with a huge range of ordinary New Zealanders, which is what we want political parties to do, right? So we should design the funding system for them so that it does encourage them to go and connect with as many ordinary New Zealanders as possible, whereas the current system in, for their funding encourages them to just spend a huge amount of time on a small number of very wealthy people. So what we recommended in the report is basically a version of the Canadian system uh, where for sort of small donations, you know, up to about $2,000, you get a tax credit for a proportion of that donation. So basically, you know, the, through those tax credits, the state is subsidising people to, to give small amounts to political parties, but capping the subsidy at a very low level. So the incentive is just for, for those for those small donations. And the the in the independent electoral review that you mentioned, they recommended per vote funding instead. So parties get um, get funding based on how many votes they, they got at the last election. And it would have sort of weighted a bit towards the smaller parties. But both, you know, our proposals were sort of you know relatively similar actually in a lot of ways. And in both cases, you know, we're talking about maybe five to six million dollars a year. You know, that's that's it. And sort of so my pitch is for, you know, so probably less than two dollars per person in New Zealand, two dollars per voter. We could just clean big money out of the system completely and absolutely and remove the sort of the potential for influence that it brings. Because even if you don't agree with me that lots of influence is being wielded as a result of these donations, the potential for it to happen is just is just obvious. I think I think it's undeniable. And the public has massive distrust of the current system. You know, over 70% of New Zealanders say they basically don't trust the way that political parties are funded. And that's very corrosive of democracy. So I think for yeah, for two dollars, you know, per voter, we could have a system that encourages political parties to go out and get their funding by engaging with the widest possible range of ordinary New Zealanders. And I think that'd be a really healthy thing. That seventy percent figure who distrust the system, did that come from your research? No, that was from research by the Institute for Governance and Policy Studies um, at Victoria University which looked at sort of trust right across the system. And look, there are lots of bits of the system that aren't highly trusted. I mean, politicians themselves aren't particularly, but that was probably the single bit of the whole political system, the way the parties are funded, that attracted the most, the highest levels of distrust. So it really is, a, it's a huge issue for New Zealanders. I just wonder though, in terms of actually getting change through, um, you know, we, we, it, we are obviously close to an election now and current polling suggests we may well have a national-led government, possibly with, with ACT as a coalition partner after October 14. Given they are obviously the two parties who benefit most from the current donation system, do you think they would want to make changes to it or be prepared to? No, they've been very clear um, in the debates last year on Labour's proposed reforms um, that they don't, they didn't see a need for change um, in the donations system. Um, so no, no, I, I, I don't think they they would enact any significant changes, possibly no changes um, at all. But I think you know this. All, all the stuff is 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 for the long term. You know, we we didn't publish this report with a view that we thought anything would happen immediately. Um, you know, we we published the report to say, well, here are the concerns. You know, here's the fact that you know most countries regulate donations much more strictly than we do. You know, most of them uh, have limits on how much you can donate to a political party in any given year. Most of them require greater transparency than we do. Many of them limit donations to, you know, to, to voters rather than companies or unions uh, or organisations. We're just sort of really trying to sort of start to build the case for greater reform. Um, I think that will take a long time. And, you know, because it's a controversial issue and it's generally not really in any party's interest to tackle it, you know, even for Labour, who don't do very well out of the current system, 
the blowback they would get from trying to tackle this issue would be immense. So I suspect we won't see any really significant change um, until we get another round of scandals, probably one that affects both major parties. And a bit like with MMP, you know, you only get really big change on these constitutional things, I think, when voters are fed up with the entire system in both major parties and there's a real plague on both your houses uh, kind of feeling. Although having said that, uh, there are so many scandals involving donations and the pace of them seems to be accelerating. So that time may actually not be that far off. Yeah, watch this space, I guess. Look, Max, thanks a lot for that. That is um, Max Rashbrook, who is a senior research fellow in the School of Government at Victoria University. And I'm Gareth Vaughan at interest.co.nz with another episode of our Of Interest podcast. Listener.